Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. Uh, I'm your host, Keith, and we are in our series, Organic Disciples. Today is the final week, week eight, and we are gonna be talking about organic outreach with uh, the man behind organic outreach, Kevin Harney. Well, let's just start with that. Yeah. What do you mean, organic outreach? Yeah. Well, years ago, when we started developing, when I became a Christian, I didn't grow up in the church, so I wanted people to understand this amazing invitation we have to share the love of Jesus with others. And so I found out that the biblical word for that was a word that means good news, and we get our English word evangelism uh, from that Greek word for good news. And so people talk about evangelism, we should do evangelism, we should share, you know, let's share the love of Jesus with other people, and that's evangelism. And then over time, it became clear to me that that term evangelism was, was taking on some negative connotations. Um, and now even the term evangelical, which doesn't mean the same thing as evangelism, and most people don't even know what evangelical means, uh, but that sort of has a similar feel. We don't know if we like that. But evangelism, that word, uh, some people would say, well, I don't, like evan- I don't like doing evangelism. Some people would say they aren't Christians. I don't like when Christians do that evangelism, trying right. to share Jesus with me. So um, people say, well, you know, the... Christians feel uncomfortable with it. Sometimes non-Christians right. feel like everyone feels uncomfortable with it. So I want to develop a ministry that helps people do evangelism, the thing that everyone's uncomfortable about. It's like, well, I don't, that doesn't, you know, from a diplomatic standpoint, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Um, and so, there, you know, there's not, not a lot of kids these days that are named Hitler, right? It's and uh, there was a point where the name Hitler didn't have any bad connotations. It was just, oh, little, little oh, you, what a cute little guy, that Hitler of yours, you know, it's like, but now it, it, you, can't, you can't get away from it, right? So I thought, um, and I know I'm not comparing evangelism to Hitler. No. Uh, I'm just saying that a, a title and name can take on these connotations where people, all of a sudden their mind right. goes somewhere. So if you say to Christians, do you want to do some evangelism? Most Christians are like, no, yeah, absolutely, never. you you go yeah. do that. And if you say to non-Christians, would you like to be evangelized? They're going to mm-hmm. say no. Right. And so uh, I thought, well, what, what what is what are we really talking about? What is that? What is that beautiful um, Greek word mean? Well, it means naturally sharing the love of God, hmm. naturally reaching out to people that don't know God's love like Jesus did, like Christians have through all history. And let them know about the love of God and the grace of Jesus, what he's done for them. And so I just started playing with, uh, I kind of did a little market testing, talking mm-hmm. to people. And I said, you know, I was trying to find a term for evangelism, you know, sharing the good news of Jesus in a way that doesn't freak people out and doesn't freak you out. And what I came up with was, you know, at first it was like, well, naturally sharing our faith, naturally talking about Jesus. What's you know, naturally natural? reaching out. And I came with, well, okay, organic, something organic, organic outreach. The, the OO, I, we haven't made the logo yet, but it's kind of a, kind of a cool logo. And uh, it's kind of like the two O's become like the infinity sign. But, um, and I came up with organic outreach and I found that for most people, they're like, they're like, well, I would, I would like to naturally learn to reach out and share God's love with people. I go, ha, that's evangelism. I would do that. I just say, okay, well, we call it organic outreach. And so for like 30 years, that's the terminology I've used. Uh, out of that, ended up writing books. Uh, Sherry and I together have written four books on the topic. Uh, you're getting out for families. How do you share, naturally share the love of Jesus in your home and as a family with your neighbors? Or getting out for churches. How do you help a church naturally share the love of Jesus? Or getting out for ordinary people. How do you just personally share the love of Jesus? And then organic disciples is about how growing in our faith helps us naturally share mm-hmm. the love of Jesus with others. And so they all tie together. Uh, and so organic outreach is naturally sharing the goodness and the love and the grace of Jesus with people who don't know about him uh, or, or maybe are resistant to it, but naturally sharing the love of Jesus in a way that doesn't freak me out when I do it and doesn't freak you out when right. I share with you. And that's organic outreach. That's yeah. cool. Well, yeah. we often talk about each of us, no matter when we came to faith, um, we have a time before we came to faith. Yep. And, yep. and that there's always going to be someone in our life mm-hmm. that had some part of sharing the good news, yeah. sh- evangelizing, yeah. Yeah. reaching out to us, yeah. uh, sharing Jesus with us. Yeah. Tell us about someone in your mm-hmm. yeah. life from your experience who who did that, yeah. and, and and were they organic in, in yeah. doing that? Yeah. Well, my uh, you know most people will be like, well, you know, my parents shared faith with me. I didn't have that. Mm-hmm. Well, my Sunday school teacher, I didn't go to Sunday school. Well, I went to a Billy Graham crusade. We, my family didn't go to a lot of crusades, <laughs> you know. So, so for me, it was my sister Gretchen, one year older than me, when she became a follower of Jesus. And Gretchen's very quiet, very shy, still is to this day. 
But when she became a Christian, she just very, out of who she is with her quietness, with her shyness, was, well, she was nicer to me. She uh, played this Christian music. It was the advent, the beginning of kind of early Christian rock. So it was uh, Randy Stonehill, Larry Norman, um, Sweet Comfort Band, all these different, all these different groups back Never in the heard of any early, of them. early, early days, pre <laughs> pre Keith Green, and which is most people don't, you know, people many wouldn't know who that is, but and and she'd play her music and she'd talk about what Jesus meant to her and she'd invite me to come to her youth group and and I was resistant and negative and I was just a punk and but but she just kept being nice and so she was she was very organic it was out of who she was she didn't get preachy or weird she just let me know that she loved Jesus and he was changing her life and. And that she was pretty sure Jesus loved me too. Mm-hmm. And that, that um, I, I, she thought I would like some of her friends that were part of her youth group. And so she just kind of did that. And, and I eventually came along with her to an event at the church. And, and uh, it was, you know, there was like a thousand high school kids. It was big. It was before mm-hmm. mega church, but this big church. And, and um, they were really nice. And, and they did some weird, you know, there's like a weird little talk. They basically all sit down and do this little talk. And so I was like, oh, that's kind of, <laughs> wasn't sure about that. But, but there were cute girls there. And so I kept going back. But, but she just loved me and cared and shared. And, you know, she hadn't any classes or any training. She just loved Jesus and she loved me. And she wanted me to know that Jesus loved me too. Mm. And so I think she did a really good job for a 16-year-old girl who grew up mm-hmm. in an atheistic home. She did a real nice job. It was very natural. So yeah. Did you give her any credit for helping develop these books then since she was a great example for you? Absolutely. She uh, she demands 25% of the cut of all the... No. Um, I, I let her know I love her. And we and we actually get, get along great and we've become good friends through the years. And, and by God's grace, all five of the kids in my family that I grew up in have become Christians Three of us do different kinds of ministry, and uh, all of us uh, encourage each other and love each other, which is which is a pretty cool thing. And we're all still living, and it's it's a blessing. There's there might be a better time later on in this to talk, to mention this, but I yeah. but I'm going to do it right now. You just said five of the kids in your family, yeah. non believing family, yeah. Yeah. came to know Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an easy thing to just gloss over, yeah. and yeah. I don't. I want to make sure that it's miraculous. Yeah, it, it, yeah. incredible. Yeah. We were not. We were not raised to. We were. We were raised in a agnostic slash atheistic intellectual worldview uh, of kind of uh, of good moralism, but no uh, foundation of that moralism in any divine mm-hmm. being. And we weren't even theistic. It wasn't like oh, there's a god out there. It was just a non deal. Yeah. So it's a. It's miraculous. Yeah. So that can happen. It can happen. It can <laughs> That's happen. Cool. Yeah. What is inorganic? Outreach, um, boy, there's there's so many examples of mm. people who are people who are, and I think people who try to share the love of Jesus with others, and who do it inorganically, they're not bad people. Right. It's not it, they just don't don't think it through. So it, it could be forcing things on people, kind of pressure tactics that every time I talk to you, I got to get to my script mm-hmm. about Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to push on you and push on you. Um, my wife had a had a, a per, person in her extended family that. Even though every, everyone in her family, her immediate family were Christians, she was, this lady was such a super Christian, she thought that she was pretty sure they might not be Christians, had to make sure they were saved. So every time they'd come, the kids would literally run and hide under their beds because this person was so pushy and so overbearing and so uh, demanding that everyone listened to her, kind of preach her stuff. Uh, that, that, that feels inorganic. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, friendships that are transactional, I'll be your friend so I can talk to you about Jesus. But if you aren't interested, I really am not. I'm just interested in you because I want to get you in the club. Mm-hmm. I think that that can feel really bad and it seems very inorganic. Um, I, th- I think that people who have memorized a script and you push the button and burp, out comes my, my memorized religious script. Um, that's nothing, you know, if I say to you, we're gonna have a conversation, um, you know, we begin this conversation knowing we're going to talk about organic outreach, right, words, but yeah. we don't know exactly where it's going to go. But mm-hmm. if I just meet you and we're getting chatting, you don't go, okay, here's the script. And, mm-hmm. and when you say this, I'm going to say this. And if you say this, I'm going to say this. You have a conversation, you use your mind, you interact. And I think that somebody who comes with this pre-memorized, um, every time I've got a, you push the button, I'm going to say the same thing. It doesn't matter if I'm talking with a 85-year-old man or a 15-year-old girl, it's going to be my script. That feels inorganic. So it, it's those things that are sort of although i do believe it's good to prepare and to think about what Absolutely. you would say and 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 think about how you'd share this and i you know we do training for people to share their faith but to share it naturally not here's mm-hmm. the script but here's the kind of here's a way to think and understand right. and interact with people and then you have just conversations you right. live life and i know that you make suggestions about what can be said asks mm-hmm. that 
yeah. questions that can be asked. Yeah. And here's some ways to go about yeah. doing it. You just took me back to seminary in my mm -hmm. evangelism class. Mm -hmm. And, oh, we were given a script. Yeah. Here's what you do. You go knock on someone's door. Yeah. And here's the questions you ask. And uh, I thought, this is just not yeah. comfortable at yeah. all. Yeah. This isn't going to go well for them. It's not going to go it well for me. It didn't feel natural to you or organic. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. 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 So, so when you say organic, do you mean easy? Do you mean unplanned? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Or do you mean something a little different than that? I've had people actually say that. Sherry and I were, my wife and I were speaking at a conference, an evangelism conference in uh, Colorado Springs, a couple right before COVID, a couple of years ago. And we were talking about this and there was a guy who said oh yeah organic you mean it just oh it just happens you don't even have to prepare just it just happens and i said no that's not what i mean at all i said i and i told him i said listen we live near the salinas valley where it's one of the largest uh, farming areas in the world and where if you they say if you have a salad almost anywhere on the planet there's something in your salad bowl from the salinas valley right. if you talk to somebody who farms and then somebody who does organic farming and if you say, oh, you organic farmers, that means you just throw some seeds out and hope they grow and it all just happens without, they say, no, it's more complex because we, we aren't using pesticides, we aren't doing certain things, <clears throat> uh, we, we have to know when to plant, how to plant. So no, organic doesn't mean disorganized and fly by the seat of your pants. It means creating an environment where the things that should happen naturally happen naturally. Mm -hmm. So you create an environment where people's hearts can respond to Jesus, where they can hear the story of Jesus. But it takes a lot of effort to do organic farming. It takes a lot of effort to do organic outreach. It takes prayer. It takes learning to share your faith, to articulate things. But then in the moment, being present enough and aware enough just to have a conversation with somebody, mm -hmm. if it goes this way and they're talking about this, it, it's not this, again, it's not a script. And so, uh, so organic outreach is not uh, unplanned, uh, random, it's actually probably more intentional, more prayerful, and more thoughtful, but it's trying to take people on a journey that is infused by the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and that feels natural to them and you because you're walking toward the one who made them and loves them. Yeah. That sounds very achievable. Yeah. Right? That's a neat thing. Yeah. We always talk about, especially in this this series, we're talking about being like Jesus. Like mm -hmm. That's what it means to be a disciple. Right? To, yeah. When I say being like, obviously we're never going to be like Jesus, yeah. but we're trying to grow, follow his example. Yeah. Um, what was the mission and passion of Jesus when mm -hmm. when he came to this world? Yeah. As we maybe seek to to emulate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus himself, uh, you know, spoke of the he came to seek and save that which is lost. He called himself this when 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 Jesus says the Son of Man, he's mean mm -hmm. he's saying I. I right. He's talking to him. It's a self is it's a a self designation, but he said he came he came you know to seek and save the lost. Another another point, uh, we know that Jesus uh, that Jesus came. Not to serve, but to not not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That his mission, his goal was to lay his life down, to love people, to share his grace, to pay the price for their sins. Uh, Jesus was absolutely committed to that, but he did it. Every person Jesus interacted with, it was like, oh, that's a different a different way mm. because it fit who they were. you know, And so with a woman at the well, he talks about living water. Why? Because they're sitting next to a well. Um, with, with Nicodemus, he has has this rabbinical back and forth, where where Nicodemus, um, this religious leader, says, "Are you saying this?" In sort of a hyperbolic, sort of a, "Oh, this is what you're saying," and then just no. I, and and so so you but you watch the conversations; they're tailored to that person. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus modeled meeting people where they were at. Um, when you know when when he meet fish fishermen, he said, "You know, we're going to start fishing for people." Right. Uh, it, it's a, you look through the gospels and see when Jesus was sharing about who he was, about his grace, about his plan for people's lives. It was out of out of who he was and out of who they were. Mm -hmm. And if it becomes, you know, it's out of a textbook for person X, fill in any person here that's not going to connect for people. I think by and large, it, it may, God can use anything. And so God sure. uses, you know, that we can stumble all around and, and God can do amazing. <clears throat> I remember I preached a sermon one time. I thought it was my worst sermon ever. I just, afterwards I felt just felt like I just totally blew it. And this young guy who was a high school student, he'd been a Christian about three years. His name was Cain named after the biblical character who killed his brother. Wow. His dad named him Cain intentionally and named his brother a name out of a book called the fountainhead, uh, where it kind of espoused an atheistic worldview. This dad named both of his boys uh, names that were kind of, um, and, th and then the dad went on to um, shoot the wife with his wife with a shotgun uh, and from behind and didn't kill her. Uh, long story, but Cain became a Christian. 
And uh, and in this church service where my, I felt like my sermon bombed and I just, it missed and I felt so broken hearted. I felt like I'd failed God. And he came up to me the next day and he said, last night during that sermon, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I need to go to seminary and become a pastor. <laughs> God called me to be a pastor. I'm, I'm like, I didn't go to him. I didn't say to him, Man, I thought I just was like, wow, that's great. And but I was like, I was like, you know, so God, so God can, we can, we can do things poorly, and God can still show up and take care of things. But we, we, I think we need to uh, do all we can to be prepared, equipped, and then when God opens the door, naturally, without forcing it out of people's throats, share the love of Jesus. Yeah. So you did talk about Jesus was really an example of organic mm-hmm. outreach because yeah. whatever setting he was in, he yep. would kind of modify what he was saying or how he was doing it to to speak their language Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what price would you say that jesus paid to reach us yeah Um, Yeah. so that's kind of a little bit beyond and deeper Mm -hmm. than that to Mm -hmm. to reach us and extend the love of the father to us yeah well jesus you know the bible says that he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of god that the perfect spotless lamb of god he who knew no eternally knew no sin he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That He took our sin on himself and he gave his righteousness to us. That's, that's you can't sacrifice more than that. You can't yeah. give more than that. He left the glory of heaven to bring the good news to us. He bore the cross and the, the physical torture, but the spiritual torture of bearing our sin. And Jesus didn't just bear our sin. He bore the judgment for our sin. So he bore, he bore the judgment of the Father that we would have received had we not given our sins to Jesus, had we not accepted Jesus. And so Jesus sacrificed everything yeah. for us. And if you, th- if you think, what, you know, what if somebody, there's cultures where, you know, and, and it's probably a theme that's played more out in movies, where if somebody, if somebody saves someone's life, they say, I'm indebted to you forever, right. I will follow I'll you. This is like a movie right. uh, kind of thing where it's like, I'm, I'll stay with you forever, I'll be, I'll be, and, until somehow maybe something happens and they get set free. But it's like, yeah. it, it's like, well, how would you respond to someone if they knowingly intentionally died for you to save you and in doing that took away all your wrongs and in doing that offered you a relationship now and in doing that offered you eternity in heaven how would you feel about that you know that person he's like well that that's what jesus did and so um he paid the price and then he says to us now you walk on the same journey i walked Mm -hmm. on get you know lay down your life serve others and share my love and share that love. But that's a hard, that's mm-hmm. hard. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that so many Christians have a hard time mm-hmm. with that? Yeah. And, and I I would say most Christians, and I get to interact with Christians all over, um, not so much the last two years, but you know, all over the world, different leaders, different you know, people that come here for training, people that I go to and do training with, my wife and I talk to about faith. And most Christians in most churches, these are people who love Jesus, believe the Bible, and they want people to know God's love. Right. But if you say to them personally, do you enjoy sharing your faith with others? Do you look for opportunities? Do you pray for chances to talk about your faith in Jesus, to share the greatness of his story and his love? Most Christians will say, that makes me nervous. That's probably one of my scariest things as a Christian. I know that God wants me to. I, in my heart of hearts, want to. But man, that's that's tough. And I, I, think, I think there's numerous reasons. Uh, one is there's huge spiritual battles that go on. There, every time we think about sharing God's love, telling one a story about our life of faith, it's like the enemy goes, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And our heart starts racing. We get all anxious and the enemy just begins to kind of tell lies. They're going to think you're stupid. They're going to think you're crazy. They're not going to like you anymore, which is almost never the case. Mm-hmm. But we buy into it. So I think there's a spiritual battle going on. That's one of the reasons we're cautious. I think there's personal fear. Um, nobody wants to feel like they're different and and kind of uh, even though as christians were called to be unique and different um and so i think there's personal fear and i think another reason that people get so nervous about it is they don't feel like they're really prepared and equipped and that's one of the reasons why we've developed organic Irish international and mm-hmm. we train and equip people and we create all kinds of resources that we put online for free so people can learn to tell their story of faith in a natural way and tell the story of jesus in a natural way so then when they're talking with somebody they can frame it and word it however they want to for that person mm-hmm. it's not a memorized script but it's a, they feel I could do this. I could talk about my faith in a way that isn't scaring people off, mm-hmm. in a way that is natural and that, that makes people go, oh, I never saw it that way. Wow, that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And once that happens a couple of times, people go, oh, this it's not as hard as it seems. Mm-hmm. So I think there's, those are three of the big kind of obstacles that keep right. people from doing it. Yeah. yeah, and I can say I'm, I'm a pastor and I've been doing this a yeah. long time. I, I have those times when mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know. They just seem real hostile. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I... Yeah. 
if I can do it. And and so they're, I think it's a, an acceptable thing. Yeah. Like you're, you're not yeah. off or yeah. there's not something wrong with you yeah. if you have a hard time. Yeah. But yeah, this is a call on us. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what well, that looks like. And when you've, when you've pressed into that and felt nervous and still stepped into it and in a natural, I had a conversation or shared something. Have there been times where it hasn't been horrible and blown up, but it's actually been, you've been like, oh, that, that was good. Well, uh, we, we have this, this neat thing where we meet monthly, as you know, obviously mm-hmm. it's the one who set it up and, and we have opportunities to share our stories. Yeah. I've yeah, almost always had a story to share yeah. because I have overcome that. Yeah. And God has, has truly used yeah. those in, yeah. in amazing ways. And, and that, I've had some, yeah. I've had some that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some yeah. that led to ultimately someone giving their life to Jesus Yeah, and, and, you know, everywhere in between. Yeah. But I, I truly have never had a, a hostile response. That's what I was going like to ask it you. Just, it just hasn't nobody's happened. Nobody's punched you or no. screamed, you're oppressing me or run, yeah. run for the door. Right. No. And, and, I, and so the people say, Oh, you know, that's not really my thing or, mm-hmm. Oh no, not right now. Or thanks anyways. Mm-hmm. You know, that's okay. But that's not right. so bad. No. I mean, and yeah. I've, and I've had conversations and ongoing relationships with people yeah. that, that I heard bashing Christians, mm-hmm. you know, speaking very poorly of them. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't even had it with them, you yeah. know, and, uh, and I've got great stories to tell from yeah. that as well, but, yeah. but it really has worked out when I've overcome it. And I think you just talked about spiritual piece to it, yeah. the spiritual yeah. warfare. I think if we really can grasp that, and, and it's mm-hmm. a hard thing for me, I'm mm-hmm. a, I'm a black and white, what right in front of me yeah. kind of guy. Yeah. That's a hard one for me. I know intellectually that it's there. I know in in my study, I know in my experience that there is spiritual aspect to all this. Yeah. I, I do yeah. know about Satan. I do know about evil powers and all that. But I but I think I lose sight of that often mm-hmm. in in each situation. And but I think when we when we really embrace that and grasp that, it it does change the yeah. way we do it because we also know that as there's the the negative spiritual, there's the evil, mm-hmm. there's also God. Yeah. There's the Holy Spirit yeah. giving yeah. us what we need in that. Yeah. Well, we're uncomfortable. You said it from the very beginning. The word evangelism yeah. makes it seems like everybody uncomfortable. Yeah. Why why are there so many non believers you think that are uncomfortable? What makes them so uncomfortable about the idea of evangelism? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, another term that some people use is like proselytizing. You know, yeah. you're, you're, try, you're trying to change my way of thinking. It's like, wait, wait, you're trying to change my way of thinking and to see the world differently and it could change, potentially change my whole life. And it's like, yeah, kind yeah. of. It's like, well, okay, there you go. There, you know, that, It's like, if someone understands what you're talking about, the, the last of the five kids in my family to become a Christian was my sister, Allison. And she, one of the reasons she was resistant is she didn't know what God might ask her to do. She was like, I, what if God, you know, she had seen me become a pastor, my brother Jason become a worship leader, my sister Lisa works in the, moves from unemployment to employment, but she's written a couple of books and she focuses on a Christian worldview. So she, we were all called a kind of different, three of the, <laughs> of her four siblings were called to some kind of a ministry type setting. My sister Gretchen was a financial person in the Irvine Water District, so a whole different, you know, but, but loved Jesus and shared Jesus with me. But, um, but for Allie, she was looking and going, it was like, what might if I do this? It's like I'm. You're talking about I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm gonna have to follow him, and I'm nervous about what he might call me. It's like, yeah. Yep. And so when she said to me, she says, "Well, I'm, I'm a little nervous about what God might call me to do." And I said, "Well, you should be nervous about that because you understand that to follow Jesus is to follow Jesus." So I think some people are nervous because they actually understand what we're talking about, and most people are not oriented towards change. I don't want to, you know, potentially change my whole life direction. Um, and, and we're kind of comfortable with the ruts we're in and what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that's, that's part of the resistance. I think also there's a caricature of how badly this has been done. Now, I think it's mostly a caricature. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I mean by that is this idea of the person with the bullhorn screaming at people on the street corner. There's maybe one in LA, one in Chicago and one in New York, right. but there's not tens of thousands of Christians out there screaming at people. Right. But, but that becomes this, this sort of the lift up is, Oh, that's what it's like. It's your, or the person that's the Turner burn. I got the sandwich board. It's got all the flames. It's got some you know, obscure portion of a passage mm-hmm. talking about this or that. And, and I'm going to say, turn or burn, you're going to hell. And I'm going to yell and scream again. There might be four or five of those people in a couple major cities here right. or there, but that's not most Christians. If, if you ask people who are not Christians, 
What do you think about Christians who evangelize? They're going to think about those very negative things and they might say, well, that's terrible and it's, it's forced. There's yelling and screaming. And if you say to them, well, has anybody ever done that with you? Right. They'll, they'll, most of them will go, well, no, I, I've, I've heard about it. I've seen it on you know, TV or whatever. I've seen it on. Mm-hmm. And say, so, well, do you know people in your life that are Christians? Oh, yeah. Well, tell me about them. It's like, well, my grandma is. I said, well, does she ever yell at you or wear a sandwich board or yell a scream with a blow? <laughs> well, no, she's like one of the nicest people I know. And what, what's her faith? Well, it seems pretty real to her. I mean, I don't agree with her, but, you know, she, and, and well, tell me, and it's another person. Well, there's this, and they, they start talking about the Christians they know, and most of them are pretty unobtrusive. Right. If anything, Christians are not overly forceful. We actually probably need to get a little bit bolder. Right. And so there's this caricature. Mm-hmm. And people get that locked in their mind and that's what it's like. Right. But in reality, that's not what most people are mm-hmm. like. Most Christians, if you ask them, do you think you're overdoing it with sharing your faith or underdoing it? Most Christians would say, probably, I'm probably on the underdoing it side of things. I'm sure it's probably not even close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the actual statistic is 98.3. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> just made that up. But, but, you know, but the idea, the reality is that's, that's not what most people are like. Mm-hmm. And so, but I think for, for non-Christians, and then I think another thing right now in this moment in time is the word evangelism and the word evangelical, uh, because they come from the, they come from the same root word. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there was a point at which uh, in the history of the church where fundamental, fundamentalism, what's called fundamentalism, kind of morphed and became evangelicalism. And that was, and really that just means people who believe that the Bible is true, that people need Jesus to be saved. There's certain things that are just like core things that most Christians believe. Most, you know, most committed biblical Christians would believe, but that term evangelical has been co-opted by some to see it. Well, that's more of a political agenda. Absolutely. That's a more of a, more of a, um, people who are against these three or four things and not for anything positive. And so if you take that word evangelical, which like I've been a pastor at Shoreline for 13 years. Have you ever heard me from the pulpit or in any setting say, we are evangelical Christians? Not that I can recall. No. no. Thomas, right. ever? We need to be better evangelicals. Let's be evangelicals, yeah, people. Thank God, no. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, be, because, but, but you'll hear me say, well, we're biblical Christians. Right. We're Christians who follow Jesus. We, we love Jesus. We are, and so, well, that's, you know, so, so but, but for a lot of people in the world, they, when you, when you talk about evangelism, they think of, oh, that's what those evangelicals do. And they're thinking of a political party or a certain mindset or attitude that's very domineering or judgmental or negative. And, uh, I don't think that that's not what the word evangelical means, but I don't want to try to redeem that word or redeem the word evangelism. I'll just use a different term like organic outreach or something, because I want to spend the time talking about Jesus, not about trying to redefine right. terms and try to convince you that that isn't what you think it means. Um, I'd rather start with, let me tell you about Jesus and who he really is. So, yeah. Yeah. Would you say that sharing our faith is, is optional for us? Is this something we, because it's hard, right? And yeah. we're uncomfortable yeah. and people don't want to hear it. So yeah. Is it, is this something we can choose to not do? I would say for every Christian who loves Jesus, they've come to the cross and received his grace and they want to live for him. It's not an option. If we'll pray for people to know God's love, if we'll love and serve people in the name of Jesus, not an option. Um, telling our stories about how God's good and how he's worked in our lives, not an option. We need to, we need to be able to share our stories and share because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then the Bible says, and how will they hear if someone doesn't proclaim or share the story? Uh, and so uh, we've got to talk about that. And, and then being able to say, uh, Peter says in first Peter three fifteen, always be prepared to give an account for the hope you have. That's the hope of Jesus mm-hmm. for the hope that you have, uh, but do it with gentleness and respect. So tell about your hope, do it gently and with respect. So I think we need to be able to tell our stories of how he's changed our life and his story. And, and the story is not that complicated. It's, you know, God loved us. He came, he paid the price by dying on the cross. Jesus, God with us. He was in the tomb for three days. He rose again. He ascended to heaven and he offers forgiveness to all who will receive it. It's, it's, it's you know, you can tell the story in about 20 to 25 seconds. Right. You can also take 25 hours and tell the story with great detail as well. But, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, as as people who are seeking to follow Jesus and honor Him, we can we can find ways to share our faith in a way that doesn't freak people out, and doesn't scare us to mm-hmm. death, but that honors Jesus. And so so you know, it's not an option whether or not I'm going to share God's love. I have to learn how to do it in a way that's natural for me and that's natural for the people I'm talking to. And and we can do that, but that's mm-hmm. part of that's something that's intentional, and that's why we spend so much time trying to help Christians learn how to articulate their faith and, and do it in a natural way. I think you mentioned in, in this podcast; it may have been one before, um, but it was 
Uh, you talked about the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. And again, that may have been this mm -hmm. podcast. I don't remember. Um, but a big thing was she went back uh, and yeah. and told people she didn't really know anything, right? Yeah. She hadn't been to any classes, yeah. you know, yeah. didn't have training. Like she just no went certification and did it, right? whatsoever. No, yes, none. Yeah, uh, and and one of the the one of the obstacles you even mentioned earlier was that we feel unprepared yeah. to do so. I'm thinking that there's a balance in there, right? Yeah, that that yeah. we have to have some foundational understanding. We have yeah. to have sound doctrine, yeah. uh, which is you know our beliefs yep. um, that have to be biblical. Why mm. is that important yeah. Yeah. in sharing our faith, that we have a sound biblical understanding? Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned uh, John chapter 4, the woman at the well, and Jesus mm. meets her, and they have an extended spiritual theological conversation, and we actually don't have the whole conversation right. recorded there. John sure. is clear in his <laughs> gospel that there's lots more that can be shared that isn't there. Uh, but, but, but we have this interaction and she recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. And like she runs back to the town and she says to people, come meet someone who told me everything I ever did. So that's kind of her story. She, this guy knows about me and, and he loves me. He offered, you know, and then she's, then she gets to the you know, personal testimony and then the testimony of Jesus. Could this be the Messiah? Mm -hmm. It's a testimony. So she gave kind of a personal testimony, a Jesus testimony without any training. I mean, she had just become his follower and she runs into town. Some people put their faith in Jesus before they even came out to meet him at the well. Mm -hmm. Others came, met Jesus, put their faith in him. But yeah, she didn't have any training, any equipping. She just shared her story and his story, and that was enough. God can do that, yes. But then also, uh, there's that be prepared to give an account. Mm -hmm. And so when we do training here and other parts of the world where we equip and train pastors and leaders and church members to be able to share their story, that to, to think it through, to practice. So every 30 days when we sit in our board meeting, um, we do about 20 to 30 minutes of outreach on training to every one of our board members. And we say we're going to do this every month, every 30 days till Jesus returns. We've been doing it for probably 10 years. So you go 10 years times and we meet about 10 times a year. We take off July and usually December if we don't have a lot of business to do. So, you know, 10 years, so, so 100, 100 times um, that you and I have been sitting with our board members and had about a half an hour of infusion and training and equipping and how to share our faith. In one of those times, before I went to visit my dad for the last time before he passed away, in one of our times learning together, we practiced we practiced sharing the story of Jesus right. with another person as if they were the person we most wanted to see come to faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I shared as if I was talking to my dad. And a short time later, when I was able to visit him on the East Coast, that preparation time had given me a unique new way to organically share with my dad that I'd never thought of before. And that preparation prepared me to share with my dad one more time and by God's grace and by his spirit, my dad prayed to receive Jesus. So um, <laughs> I've been doing this kind of training every 30 days with groups of leaders for 20 plus years. Right. And I still look forward to it. And I, you say, well, you wrote the books and you believe in this stuff and you're a pastor. You know this stuff. Why in the world do you still need to be talking about this stuff? Because God gives you fresh new understanding and mm -hmm. a new excitement and new energy and new learning to be able to share the story of Jesus, not in one memorized way, but in any dynamic way that the mm -hmm. spirit leads. Well, and, and you know, I think an interesting thing is anything we do well, it's that same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you play a musical instrument, you play a sport, you have a mm -hmm. hobby, you know, just go, well, I did this before. Yeah. So now I'm just done. I've got it figured out. You have to keep yeah. putting in the work. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you know, teachers have, continuing education mm -hmm. like there's mm -hmm. there's always yeah. got to be more yeah it's no different in yeah. this if we really want to yeah. excel we want to honor god yeah. and and to do it well and even even prodigies are not prodigies right. if you know malcolm gladwell uh wrote his his book outliers and i love i read almost everything i get He's my hands on that he, he writes yeah. and and outliers talks to people that, that are exceptionally above and beyond good at something but when he looks at it, is all these people that we think are prodigies um, they just spent thousands of hours practicing and people, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like, Oh, look. And so, so you, you hear a person play piano and you say, Oh, you're such a natural. And they're like, do you know how many thousands of hours it took to, to sound this natural? Uh, -huh. uh same thing with sharing our faith. Uh, we can prepare, we can pray, we can practice, um, other things to start with letter P. Uh, but, but, but there's a point where we start to also share and, and talk it, but the preparation really does set the table for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. We talked about why people don't like the word evangelism. Mm -hmm. um, both Christians and non-Christians, believers and non-believers, mm -hmm. um, and and that gets in the way sometimes. I think of of Christians sharing mm -hmm. their faith. Mm -hmm. well, what are some other things that that get in the way of Christians sharing their faith? Yeah, 
Well, I would. I think I'd circle back to some things we talked about. You know, yeah, pers pers personal fear. Mm -hmm. uh, how are people going to respond to me? Uh, because some people may not like it. Some people mm -hmm. may push back. Uh, I think people people don't feel like they really know what to say or how to say it. Then they have people who just are quieter. They're mm -hmm. not. They're not real uh, chatty to start with, right? And so that's why that's why we talk about organic outreach, sharing in a way that's natural for you and natural for them. Mm -hmm. And so it, if you're afraid because you don't feel prepared and equipped, then take some time to get prepared and equipped. Right. equipped. If you're if you're if you're not sharing because you uh, are afraid that people are going to respond. Well, like you like you shared before, when you start sharing with people, you may discover that they don't respond as as strongly as you imagine they might in a mm -hmm. negative way. Uh, usually when we're left with a blank spot in our mind of what might happen, we fill right. it with the worst possible scenarios and it's almost never that bad. Uh, or it might be that you're reluctant or resistant because you had a really bad experience with one person. Don't let that one person define it. If you had a bad experience with a doctor, don't say, I'm never going to a doctor again. They're all bad. <laughs> no, you had, a, you had a bad doctor. Right. But it doesn't mean, you know, so, so if somebody had one bad experience to say, you know what? I need to have a couple of more positive experiences to kind of balance that out and keep keep pressing forward. Well, you beat me to the punch because that's where I was going to go to. <clears throat> Here's some things that prevent us from sharing. How can we overcome them? And those yeah. are some great natural yeah. steps. Yeah. I love a story. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you talked about um, doing a kind of a walkthrough prior to meeting with your dad and being able yeah. to share with him again. Um, can you share another story that's maybe like a journey that you've mm -hmm. gone on mm -hmm. with organic outreach um, yeah. that... Can give us like a, maybe a fuller picture of what, yeah, what this yeah. looks like. Well, we I, I mentioned uh, I've mentioned I think in one, in one of the podcasts about having a group on, on community, having a small group of friends that I fish with. I'm not mm -hmm. into fishing. Right. Uh, when I, I go with this group of friends to fish about once a year, and between those that trip and the next time, I don't fish. I don't freshwater fish. I don't saltwater fish. I don't uh, deep sea fish or lake fish. I don't fish. Mm. I go. I enjoy being with these people. Well, one of this group of of guys uh, was uh, a non-believer. And the first time this group went down together, I wasn't there, but a guy, Nabil Qureshi, who uh, who, has, who died of stomach cancer, but was a good friend of Shoreline Church and a good friend of mine in Sherry's, he was part of the group that went down there fishing. And the first time we went down there, he got talking with this guy, and every night uh, they'd, they'd sit for like three, four hours and, and talk and debate. This guy's a Cornell grad, very sharp guy. And uh, they just debate and talk and have a lot of fun. Not not nothing hostile, right. totally organic, but just like I don't believe that. All right, what about this and what about that? And just great, you know, great conversations. The next year we were all down there, and there were, and then I was there as part of that group, and Nabil was there for the next couple of years. Every night, we'd sit for two, three, four hours and just talk about life, about uh, about the world, but about faith. And we'd agree to disagree. We'd have very different perspectives, and it would be it could it could get really hot and fiery, mm -hmm. but not mean. <laughs> You know, just intense and you know, well, well, you know, and push back and disagreement, and then we, then we, you know, hang out and go fish the next day and have meals, and we, we, care, you know, nobody hated each other, but we just disagreed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so year after year, so then two years ago when we went, there were four of us that went, and by this time Nabil had passed away, was with Jesus, but um, had some great spiritual conversations, and this one, this one person was clearly his heart was growing more and more open. But uh, it just wasn't there yet. And I, and I even at one point I said, you know, where are you at? Are you ready? He said, I got too many questions, too many things. No problem. You, know, it's, you don't have to, you know, you don't force people. That's not, mm -hmm. there's nothing organic about, uh, you know, there's a book I read years ago called The World Changers about evangelism. Or they didn't use the term organic outreach, they use evangelism. Mm -hmm. And the cover of the book is a picture of a Muslim man laying on the ground. It's a drawing, okay? Muslim man laying on the ground, a Christian crusader on a horse with a lance right against the, guy, the guy's neck. I mean, like right there, about to pierce his throat. And the, the guy laying on the ground is saying, yes, tell me more about this Jesus. I'm terribly interested. <laughs> um, and, and it's like, it's a great, it's a great, great. It's like you know, that, it's like, is that, there's nothing organic about that. There's and, and, Not even a little bit. And if somebody then says, okay, I'll believe whatever you tell me to believe, do they, do they actually believe it, right? So we got to this point at the end of our time where I, I asked him where he was at and he just said, I'm not there yet. And say, hey, that's all right. And we maintained that friendship over time. Went back again this year and uh, went fishing. And the second to the last night, the second to the last night, I, uh, we talked about faith again. We had a great conversation and I just felt like it was time to ask him if he was at a place where he was ready to receive Jesus because his heart was growing a lot more open. You could see it. And he, his questions were, were warmer and less intense and his listening was a very active, always an active listener, always a great thinker. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked one of the guys, I said, why don't you share a Bible passage that you think would be meaningful to this, this person? I asked, the, and then the other one actually had stepped out of the, out of the we were out on the, on the 
um, patio, kind of overlooking the ocean. And one of the guys left for a couple minutes. He was doing something else. He came back after this one person shared a Bible passage. That I, I, and I hadn't told him in advance we were going to do this. I just, you know, what's the passage you think would really speak to this friend of ours who's searching spiritually and asking a lot of questions? And he shared. The other guy came back. He'd been gone the whole time. And I said, hey, do you have a passage you could share that you think would be meaningful? Exact same passage. And I said, I, I was just like, I, I was kind of like, listen, it's like magicians. We've never met each other, right? right? We, we didn't plan this. This, this right. wasn't, you know. <laughs> and I said, of all the passages in the Bible that these two guys could think of for you, to think of the same passage, that means something. And so this other guy shared about um, mm. about what it meant to him and about what, what he thought could speak to this guy as he was kind of trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing and consider receiving Jesus. And then I shared a little bit. And then I said, can you think of any reason at this point that you wouldn't give your heart to Jesus? And he said, no. He said, I think I'm ready. And I did something I don't, wouldn't normally do, but I said to him, listen, let's talk about this tomorrow night. I said, I, want you, I really want you to take the next 24 hours and think about it and just say, God, if you're really there and, and grab and just, and we'll come together tomorrow night and we'll talk again like we do every night and maybe something else has come up, but I want to make sure that you, re, you don't feel any sense of pressure. It just felt like for him with his intellectual background, I didn't want him to feel he was being coerced in any way. Go through the next day, had a great day, sat down that night and I just said, right, the, I said, I said, well, where are you at? And he said, I'm ready. <laughs> and this guy who, who, you know, seven years before was a staunch intellectual atheist, still with lots of questions, but had enough questions to answer to respond to Jesus. We prayed together. He received Jesus and we were right near the ocean. I said, what would you think? And two of us that were there were pastors. So what do you think about walking down to the water and just baptizing you right now? And he said, I'd like that. And we did that. And then I ordered, uh, I went on Amazon, ordered him a great NIV study Bible and got to his house, I think the day after he got back home again. We all read the Gospel of John together for some learning and some growth. While we sat in the airport, before we parted ways, we were kind of heading in different directions. We sat in the airport. He said, now, I'm a Christian now. I believe I'm going to try to follow Jesus. He says, but I'm not going to church. And I, there's some, some things I'm not going to believe. And I said, that's fine. I said, you know, just start with walking with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And and he said he wasn't going to go to church. Well, then about a month and a half later, he came up to Monterey because we were going to cook a bunch of the fish that we had caught and hang out together and talk about the Gospel of John, which we've been reading. About two hours of conversation about, the, he had such unique insight and beautiful insight to the Gospel mm. of John, the person of Jesus, questions he was asking. He was reading the notes in his study Bible and just, he's, he's a thinker. He's, you know, so he digging in and we had a great time talking about that. And then that was on a Saturday night. He was staying over to the next day. And so he said, I think I'm going to come to church with you guys in the morning. Well, one of his deals was, I'm not going to go to church, right. right? And he came, and afterwards he goes, he goes, he goes yeah, you know, that, that was, you know, I, I kind of like that. That was, that was, that was good. You know, he was like, mm -hmm. not, he wasn't all in, but he was like, it wasn't terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, he said, you know, and as I looked around, he said, these people, they really believe this. They re and I said, yeah, I said, I said, most of them. You know, there's some that are there that, that are like where you were at. They don't know, believe in Jesus. But I said, but a lot of them, they, this is this is deep and this is real. And so, so that was kind of a next step, and we went on that journey. And so, and again, the journey doesn't stop when somebody becomes a Christian. Right. It just continues as you're walking together and as Christians toward Jesus. Yeah, so. I, I. This hasn't been that long, but I've heard that story in yeah. multiple settings a bunch of times, and it yeah. continues to to resonate yeah. with me. Yeah. It hit me, and I want to make sure that I uh, was listening to this this podcast get this this is a journey oh yeah right this wasn't so seven, day one seven years, right yeah. this wasn't day one hey i'm gonna yeah. share jesus with you bam he's in yeah, yeah. like this this yeah. took a lot of time yeah. with different approaches yeah. different people for yeah. a long time yeah. and ultimately landed yeah. there and so uh, it could be easy to give up somewhere yeah. along the way and yeah. not not endure with that mm -hmm. um but but when you see the, yeah. the end result and again it's not even the yeah. end result right the current result you know yeah, which is yeah. fantastic and i would say this with all my heart if it was another five or seven or ten years that we were going down there fishing i would still love this guy mm -hmm. he would be a friend and if he never came to that place where he received jesus i would have kept loving him and walked along with him as a friend to the end because that's what you do mm -hmm. you don't people aren't spiritual projects they are people loved by jesus who he gave his life for and we need to love them the way he loves them and so it's not like you're my you're my um, religious duty. It's not, you're my friend mm -hmm. and we're going to walk together as friends. Yeah. Would you say that churches as a whole, we, we talk a bit about individuals and our, mm -hmm. your personal journey, journey, and you happen to be a pastor yeah. at a church who's yeah. leading organic outreach. Um, but would you say churches as a whole, the church, like as an organization believes in evangelism? I would say that every Every biblical church I know 
absolutely believes in evangelism. So then I have to ask yeah. real quick, yeah. and you might already be going yeah. here. Why does it seem yeah. like they don't yeah. truly engage in it or do it yeah. so rarely? Because there's lots of things we believe in that we never act on as human beings. You know, um, there's lots of, we, we can have deep convictions and not let them move us to action. And so uh, I would, you know, I would say every church I know that says, that say Bible believing Christian church would, would, they might have a mission statement. They might have a, you know, a sign over their door as you're leaving that says you're now entering the mission, right. you know, the, the, the world you know, and, and they, and they, they believe it, but the vast majority of churches that we work with through Organic Outreach International, and this 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 goes from you know, Honduras and El Salvador to New Zealand, Australia to Kenya to Uganda to um, India and Sri Lanka. I mean, we've we've done work all over the world. Um, the vast majority of churches globally believe in this, but do not, on a church cultural level, live it out very well. And this is why pastors, we've had pastors come here from, you know, just different far reaches of the world to come here and be trained in how to change the culture of their church because they believe in it, but they're not sure how to get there. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the reasons why we've developed, uh, if and if you're if somebody's listening to this and they're a pastor or a leader in a church, uh, go to organicoutreach.org. There's a website there that has... It would take you. It would take you three or four hundred hours to review everything on that website, and ninety-five percent of that is free. Mm-hmm. There's some right. things that we do, the services we offer, coaching, training, uh, videos. You can download an entire, like an entire ten-hour training that are monetized, and that helps underwrite mm-hmm. the cost of the ministry. But ninety-five percent of this stuff is free, including a seven-year curriculum on changing the culture of a church. Mm-hmm. And right now we have it. I think it's in seven languages. Or I, I know, I know it's in English, Spanish, and we've got. Couple of languages for India, one in Africa, uh, and so, anyways. Uh, but almost everything on the website is free. We we spend all this time create these resources and put them out there for free because we know that churches want to go down this road and not sure how to get there. Mm. And so we want to do all we can to help churches and movements and denominations do this. And Organic Arch International exists to partner with believers and leaders and churches and movements mm-hmm. and help them go out with the gospel in natural ways. And so it's it's churches believe in it. Very few do it well, and if they make that decision to do it well, it can be transferred. And it makes the church so dynamic and so exciting when you walk down that road. And, and we did just talk about the church as the organization, but the church is, as we always say, is, is the people. Yep. It's made up of the people. Yep. What can, and you've touched on it a bit, but I want to make sure we really hit on this because I'm, yeah. again, always about the practical. What can we yeah. do? What can, just your, at, your ordinary, you're, yeah. you wrote a book about yeah. that, right? Organic outreach for ordinary people. What can an ordinary, Jesus-loving mm-hmm. yeah. Christian do to engage more fully in, yeah. in sharing their faith yeah. with others? Yeah. Well, there's some easy automatic things. First, start praying. Pray for people that are far from Jesus. Pray for yourself to be bold and courageous. Um, Jesus, Jesus told us to pray, therefore, that the Lord of the harvest will send workers out into the mm-hmm. harvest field. His prayer at that at that point when he says the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. So you pray for yourself and for Christians to go out to the harvest field. He didn't say pray for those hard hearted pagans. He said pray for Christians who aren't going out. So pray for yourself, pray for the world, pray for the lost, uh, and then get near people, hang out with people that don't know Jesus. If you've isolated yourself, build some new friendships, re- reconnect some old friendships of people that are far from Jesus. Even if it makes you uncomfortable, that's probably a good thing to be uncomfortable a bit sometimes as a Christian. Uh, learn to articulate your faith. In the book you mentioned, Organic Outreach for Ordinary People, we go through like eight or nine different ways to share the faith. Because with different people in different settings, it's not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. And so learn to share your faith, practice sharing your faith, articulate your faith. Um, We, we, I had a while back where I was trying to figure out how to share the faith in the simplest way I could think of. And I came, I finally came down to eight words in four little couplets of two words each. And uh, the letters that start each of the couplets are G-O-G-O. So it's go, go. And so go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And so, uh, and, and so those, those four words are to, to share the whole story of Jesus, God's love, then our problem, God's solution, our response. Those eight words, if you, okay, if you could share with somebody God, God's love, there's a God who loves you, he knows everything about you, he still loves you and he pursues you, God's love. Our problem. Everyone has a problem or have wandered from God. And you can share Bible passages, all sure. of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But you, you know, the, our problem is that sin separates us from God, from each other, and we live under the judgment of sin. So God's love, our problem, and then, then God's solution, the next G. 
and that is Jesus. Jesus, God came among us. He gave his life on the cross. He paid the price. He took our sins. He died in our place. Mm-hmm. Three days later, he rose again. And he ascended to heaven. So, so God's solution is Jesus. And if you receive him, he'll transform you. So you have, it starts with God's love. Our problem is sin. God's solution is Jesus. But then finally, our response. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do about it? Jesus doesn't force himself on us. He offers himself to mm-hmm. us. We shouldn't force Jesus on people. We should offer Absolutely. Jesus to people. So our response is, will we receive the gift of grace? Will we receive Jesus Christ? Mm-hmm. And so I tell people, you with eight, if you can remember eight words, you can share the story of Jesus. And I have had a just numerous people through the years that have learned that simple, that little mnemonic, that little simple eight words, those four little couplets, G-O-G-O, say, I had an opportunity to share Jesus and I would not have been ready, but I just was right. like, okay, well, you know, for, I just want to talk to you about how there's a God who loves you and they just talk about that and, but you know, we have a problem. Our problem is sin and, but you know, here's the good news. God has a solution. He sent Jesus. So uh, what's our, what's our response? Here's how I responded. I received Jesus. How do you respond? And they're like, I could do this because mm-hmm. they have those simple hooks to kind of place things on and that, and so, so get equipped, get trained. And then when God gives opportunities, pray, mm-hmm. open your mouth and share something. You also write about how there's different um, styles that we can have mm-hmm. in how we mm-hmm. share our faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them, I love a story, and one of yeah. them is your testimonial. Yeah. So that's uh, that's telling your story. Yeah. How can our story of faith impact mm-hmm. the lives of those who, who are spiritually curious? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think our stories are powerful because there are stories. Mm. We live in a world where people say, well, you have your truth, I have my truth, and you believe this, I believe that. But in that kind of a kind of a setting, say, okay, well, this is my story. Mm. I'm not telling you what you have to believe. I'm not telling you what you're right or wrong about. I'm telling you how I met Jesus, how he changed my life. Here's who I was. Here's who I am. And that's my story. So we, we have a story of our conversion when we came to faith in Jesus. And I think every Christian should be able to say, you know, I was, I share, I was 15 years old. My wife says, I was, mm. I was five years old different stories but that's her story that's my story so people are open to hearing our stories most of the time right. don't force it on people but if they're open say well, you know can i share my story of how i how my life was changed by a friendship with jesus mm-hmm. and if people are like yeah i'd like to hear that share your story how he transformed your life changed you and when you share that story be sure you share his story right. so when i'm telling my story i say so this is so this is how i my life changed i went to this youth group when i was 15 and and i heard this message about uh, this and and then my, my sister was sharing this and this guy Doug was sharing this and and they shared about how God loves me and how how I was separate from God but how I could receive God through faith in Jesus and and that He paid the price and so I I share the gospel those eight words the, mm-hmm. those those you know God's love our problem God's solution our response I share that in my story about how I responded so I'm not saying you need to do this right. I'm saying this is what I did and they'll say does that does that make sense to you. And would you want to talk more about that? And and some people will be like, that makes sense, but I don't want, I remember one time with my dad, years before he became a Christian, I he he, he heard my story. We talked for like a couple hours and he was, I told him I want to share the difference God had made in my life. And so I shared many testimonies of God's power in my life and God's presence in my life. And at the end of sharing those things, I said, dad, are, where are you at? Are you ready to learn more or maybe take a next step towards Jesus? And he said, he said that's good for now. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And the organic response is to go, okay, well, we'll talk again in the future, but you're good for now. That's good. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, what if he dies tomorrow? And then I I didn't force him to believe in Jesus. Well, forcing it on him, becoming inorganic doesn't help the cause. And the next time we were together, (coughs) the next time we were together, we talked about Jesus a little bit more in in another setting, in another hopefully natural way. So you just said you told many stories. Yeah. Elaborate on that a little bit, what that means, right? Because we did just talk about the conversion story. Yeah, well, that yeah. time I went to see my dad. I was living here in Monterey, where we are now, and he was living down in Orange County still before he moved to live by my sister, Elisa, on the East Coast. And so he was living in, in uh, down there. And I called him and I said, or I sent him a text. I sent him a text and I said, Dad, um, I know how much you love me. I know you've heard my story of Jesus at different times in different ways, but I'd love to come down and just take you out to lunch, take you to Mimi's. That was his favorite place to eat, uh, Mimi's Cafe, and just buy you lunch and spend a couple hours and just share with you about the the many ways God's made a difference in my life. Would that be okay? And I got no response back for a little, you know, for a number of days. So <laughs> like, I thought, oh, oh, okay, no. maybe, you know. <laughs> so I reached out again. I said, Dad, I don't, you know, I never want to push you. And I sent another text. I never want to push you. I never want to bug you. But did you get my text? And would you be open to that? And then he responded back and he said, he said, well, I was taking some time to thoughtfully craft a response, which is how my <laughs> dad, dad wrote right? and talked. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay. You know, I went, we went back and forth a little bit. And, and, but he said, but you know, he said, I'd love to have you come down and I'd love to 
to have lunch and just let you share whatever's on your heart. Great. So we just, so for like two and a half hours, uh, I just shared every story I could think of from the day I became a Christian till that day of how God had worked in my life. And so I, I say we have a testimony of our conversion, but we have hundreds of testimonies of God's presence, God's faithfulness, God's power, God's healing, God's grace. And I just shared story after story after story. I just shared stories about how Sherry and I had experienced God's leading in our lives in very specific ways. Mm-hmm. And whenever I talk about, and this was after my mom had passed away, when I talk about how Sherry and I, how God would move in our lives in a very powerful way, uh, tears would just well up in his eyes. And my dad's not a teary kind of guy. Um, but but it touched his heart to see how God would speak to Sherry and I together and keep our hearts bound mm-hmm. together. That meant a lot to my dad. And so, yeah, so so for like two and a half hours, I just shared story after story of how God had spoke and how God had led and how we were led to how we were led to Shoreline Church and how there was a clear leading of God and there was no denying it. And so just testimony after testimony after testimony. Mm-hmm. And he received those, was really open. But again, at the end of that time, he wasn't there yet. He wasn't ready to make that commitment. It's like, well, at that point, the organic thing is to say, hey, that's okay. We'll just keep talking and you know, I'm your son. You're my dad. We'll keep walking this road together. And we mm-hmm. did. And we did all the way to where he stepped into the arms of Jesus. So I, I love the idea of having a bunch of stories. Yeah. And when Je- we talked earlier about Jesus, whether he's talking to, to Nicodemus, mm-hmm. he's got an approach there. If yeah. he's talking to the woman at the well, mm-hmm. he's going there. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in my life, I, I've got lots of stories. Yeah. And I mean, if, if I'm talking to someone who's struggling uh, it, with a child, mm-hmm. I can tap into that mm-hmm. bag of stories yeah. of where God has shown up and made a difference. Yeah. If, if I'm talking with somebody who's struggling with drugs and alcohol, I yeah. can go back to the time when I was in drugs yeah. and alcohol and yeah. I can tap into that when yeah. someone's got a, a sickness that they're dealing with. I can yeah. go into one of my stories where God showed up yeah. in healing. Yeah. Um, relationships, the same thing. And yeah. when we, but we have to, I think, spend some time yeah. even thinking through these, right? Like yeah. we've got to, Mm-hmm. We've got to prepare, mm-hmm. maybe, but yeah. but at least recognize when yeah. God has showed yeah. up. All yeah. of those times in your life yeah. that 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 He's been there for you, because yeah. I think it is easy just to focus on that conversion yeah. and kind yeah. of forget all of the rest. Well, I, I think sometimes we look at it like uh, if you're going to do, you know, if you're going to work on different things, you need different tools in your toolbox, mm-hmm. right? And if you open your toolbox and all there is is a hammer or it's or a sledgehammer, right? So like the other day I couldn't get the, I've got this, uh, I've got this big briefcase that when I travel, I do cause I carry lots of books and stuff and it has this handle. It goes click, 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 click down. And you push button. It's a Swiss army oh, yeah. thing. And it click, click, click up. Well, I wouldn't go down. It wouldn't go down. Well, I needed this tiny little screwdriver uh, that had a star on the end, not a, not a Phillips head or a flat, right. a star. And it was really small. And I found someone who had something and I could get in there. And once I tighten those up, because it, it would only get on one and it wouldn't go down. And I couldn't get on the plane, right? So I tighten these things up and click, click, click. It's good as new, right? Uh, if I had to try to sledgehammer on that, it, trust me, it would have it would have done more damage than good, right? It might have gone down, though. It, I, could, I, could have, I could have hammered it down, but it would never, you know. And, and I think when it comes to sharing our faith, it doesn't ha- hurt to have more tools in the toolbox, more stories to tell, more ways to share the gospel. I, I went through evangelism explosion training at Coral Ridge Church with James Kennedy and his team years ago. I've been through, I've read, I probably have 50 or 60 evangelism books on my mm-hmm. shelves in my part of my library that's about evangelism. And, I, and I've and i not read every one of them cover to cover, but I read lots of them. And I, I, I take training from people and learning. And you say, well, you write books about this. I want I want every tool in the toolbox possible. So if I meet the person who is like, oh, that, that, that way of sharing, telling my story that way, that way of talking about Jesus works more in this setting, mm-hmm. I want to have that tool in the toolbox. Uh, and so, uh, and if somebody, if somebody basically has a sledgehammer and that's it, uh, it's not going to be real organic and it's not going to, I think be in some ways they may drive people away from Jesus rather than draw people toward him. So to be prepared as best we can. And then in the moment that God opens the door, be as prepared as you can. And now let the Holy spirit lead Mm -hmm. and do it organically, Mm -hmm. do it out of who you are and look at who you're talking to and then let the spirit lead you. And God can, God takes it from there. Yeah, I love that idea. If you try to just use the sledgehammer, you could turn people off or yeah. move them away. If you're like, you have your story, and like someone's yeah. like, I'm having a really rough time in your my marriage and it's just not working. I'm like, hey, well, let me tell you about a time when, you know, I yeah. was dealing with alcohol. Yeah. Like, but that doesn't work, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you're not in, you, do you care about me? Yeah. Because I think that's a Are big part of this, right? Like, like, you don't you, even listen to the right, conversation. Tone deaf, yeah. Like, you yeah. don't have a clue what's yeah. going on. Um, so we want to be prepared. We want to 
have looked at our stories. We want to be able to recognize what God has done yeah. at our point of conversion and throughout our life. Yeah. Beyond that, what 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 is the next step, or maybe a next mm-hmm. couple of steps mm-hmm. that that we can take right mm-hmm. now in order to engage in a lifestyle? And I think mm-hmm. and, and I really think it is. It's a lifestyle of organic yeah. outreach. Yeah. It's not like a thing we do, but yeah. this is like a call on, yeah. on believers. How, yeah. how do we do that? I would say first recognize that that not only are you called by God to to shine as light, to scatter the seeds of the gospel, to be salt in a world that Jesus talks about. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Uh, scatter the seeds. Not only recognize that you're called to, but that you can do this. Mm-hmm. To say, I, I can do this. And 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 yes, only a small percentage of Christians have the, the calling and the unique calling and ministry and gifting of an evangelist. I didn't know when I became a Christian that I was an evangelist. That's one of the ways God's gifted and made me. I just knew that everyone I knew that didn't know Jesus, I wanted to share Jesus with. And some of them became Christians. Or I mean, I didn't... I. I didn't know even quite how to share things, but I shared and they wanted to know more about Jesus. And I, I tried to learn enough to be able to talk to them about it because it was all new to me. But, um, but, I, so, but I, about 97 to about 95 to 97% of Christians aren't called to be an evangelist, but they're called to be Christians, which means that we all find natural ways to share our faith. Mm-hmm. So to say, I'm called to do this and I can do this. And then take a next step of learning, of getting equipped, um, you know, go on the Organic Outreach website and watch some of the videos that are there. Um, the, the book I wrote, Organic Outreach for Ordinary People, when I was right, when it was still in manuscript form, I was talking with a college, a younger college student who said, and this is a student, young person who loved the, loved Jesus, believed in, believed the Bible, and he said, he said, you know, I'm not an evangelist. I could, I, I can't do. I've tried. I can't do it. And I said to him, would you do something for me? Would you read the first chapter or two of this book, Organic Outreach for Ordinary People, and just tell me what you think about it? He said, sure. So a couple, like a week, two weeks later, he came back to me. He, I said, well, what'd you think? He goes, I read the whole thing. I said, you did? He goes, yeah. He said, it wasn't that hard to read. He says, and I think I'm an evangelist. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, I said, I know you, you're not an evangelist. He says, well, but I can do all this stuff. I can do all that stuff. And I said, that just means you're a Christian. Yeah. You're part of that 95 to 97% that don't just do it spontaneously, but you do it with in a natural way by taking time to learn. And he said, but there's nothing in there I couldn't do mm-hmm. and uh, and that's and that's what I want people to recognize is that they can do this take a next step so so get a good book on evangelism read it um, you know watch a podcast like this think about it and then just start taking steps in friendships to say what's the next step can I share my story the things we've been talking can mm-hmm. I share my story can I share his story can I invite somebody to a place where they're going to be around other Christians who love Jesus and can I just take and and then prayerfully have boldness to take a next step mm-hmm. and a next step trusting that God will work through you knowing and this would be probably my last thing I'd want to say to people is knowing that you can pray for people you can love people you can share with people you cannot save anyone amen that's left to Jesus alone mm-hmm. I didn't die on the cross you didn't die on the cross yeah. I didn't pay the price for sin you didn't pay for the price for sin Jesus did so we introduce them to Jesus we point them towards Jesus we share about Jesus and God changes hearts. And that's and, and so then we can, once we've done our part, we can go, okay, Lord, I'm leaving it up to you as if that is like some revel, revel I'm glad I'm going to leave salvation up to you. It's like, no, God, that, that's yours. Only you can change a heart and change a life. So when my dad finally put his faith in Jesus, I didn't look and go, I got him. Look, I, well I saved done. him. I look and go, thank you, Jesus, that I could be part of this journey. And what a privilege to walk that journey with my dad for over four, for 43 years praying for him, loving him, sharing with him. But at the end of the day, uh, the Apostle Paul says, we can scatter seed, we can water, but God makes things grow. Only God changes hearts. Amen. Yeah. That's a wonderful way to end. All right. Thank you again. This has been a wonderful series, and yeah. uh, and I truly am uh, hopeful for what God's going yeah. to do through this. I'm praying it'll be a blessing to many people. Thanks. Amen. Thank you. Great to be with you for the whole journey. Yeah, it's been a long one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more. We'll see you next time.